Um, before we preach on this and discuss it and see if it can go down into our hearts as the true gospel, let's ask for the Lord's blessing on our talk. Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you for the chance to hear your word spoken and read and preached. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear it, that you would cleanse our hearts from the the sin and self-love and selfishness that we bring into your presence today, and that you would make our hearts clean by the blood of your Son so that we could receive the good news, and that it would restore us to life and health. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this passage in John 11 is actually, in my view, a commentary on a famous verse from the Old Testament. And so at the risk of just reading you the Bible for an hour, I would like someone to turn to Jeremiah 29, 11. Can someone read that for me, for us? Jeremiah 29, 11. Unless I've misquoted that passage or that reference. It's a very famous verse that you're doubtless going to be familiar with when you see it. Does somebody have it in front of them? Do you have it? Okay. Do you mind reading it into the mic? 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then 12 and 13 again, sorry. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me, when you seek me with all your heart. And 14, keep going. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place to the place from which I sent you into exile. There it is. Because you have said, oh, should I keep going? Oh, yes. One more. Okay. Because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon, thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David and concerning all the people who dwell in this city, your kinsmen who did not go out with you into exile. There we go. Thank you, Missy. Oh, I love that passage. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. You know that passage, right? You're familiar with that great, timeless statement of the Lord's compassion on his people and his promise to lead them out of exile, to provide for them, to give them a future and a hope. And the thing I want you to consider today as we read the gospel together is that this passage in the gospel of John, where the Jews go to the Pharisees and they go to the Sanhedrin and they hold a council and they decide to have Jesus arrested and killed is a commentary on that passage in Jeremiah. Maybe even a profound fulfillment of that prophecy in Jeremiah. And I want to suggest that it's not just a prophecy of fulfillment in the first century, but that it's a fulfillment in your life today and is the cause of great hope and great encouragement for those of us who struggle. And I want to explain what I mean by that and give us something to think about and talk about, not just today, but maybe all week. We can mull it over. But a couple of comments about the passage itself from John chapter 11. First of all, who is it? It's got a little ring. Right? Who is it that is um, going to the Pharisees and telling on Jesus? Did you notice? Who goes and tells on Jesus? It's Jews. Anything else we know about them? Jesus, Jews that, that went with Mary, presumably to the tomb, right? And saw what? They saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Right? And what did they do in response to seeing Lazarus raised from the dead? Check 
hard nuts about there. Okay, who is it that's telling on, on Lazarus? It's Jews who, or sorry, who's telling on Jesus? It's Jews who have seen Lazarus come back from the dead. And what? Does anybody notice? Who are these people? Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Right? So these are Christians. They haven't been called Christians yet, but pretty soon they will be. They'll be known as believers, as Christians, who have come to report to the religious leaders of the day what has happened. What do you think their tone was when they came to report what had happened and what they'd seen? Oh my goodness gracious, this is terrible news. You think that's what they said? I don't think so either. They probably said, this is great news. We've just seen a man come back from the dead at the hands of a guy who says he's been sent from God to fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament and to save the world. Congratulations, religious leaders. Your day has come. Isn't this great? And I want you to notice the response of the Pharisees and religious leaders. The chief priests and Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, all is lost. How do you read that? For my whole life, I've read it like this. The Pharisees and religious leaders who were evil to the core and were created for the very purpose of opposing Jesus and going to their fiery doom in the wake of the final judgment when it would be clear to all people that they're the worst people ever said what we would expect them to say. Jesus is terrible. Let's have him killed. But really what they say is, what are we to do? As if there's some question in their minds. If they were really the worst people ever, what they would have said is, now it's very clear what we need to do. We've got to get rid of this guy right now. But instead they say, oh no, we've got a problem. And I want to suggest to you the reason they say we've got a problem is that they are believers too. We don't have any evidence that they're not. The, Jew, the Jewish believers who have seen Lazarus come back from the dead go sprinting to the Sanhedrin and say, we've just seen a guy raised from the dead. And I want to suggest to you that a good chunk of the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin said, what great news! He just brought a guy back from the dead and we have verifiable evidence that it's true. The Messiah has come. All of the hope of Israel is fulfilled. Praise the Lord. I'm so happy. Uh-oh, wait a minute. We got a problem. We got a problem. On the one hand, we have verifiable evidence that the Messiah is here, whom we have been waiting for all our lives. On the other hand, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, which would be great news because we believe he's the Messiah too, but the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. It could be that the Pharisees and the religious leaders who believed in Jesus based on the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead had this question in their minds. If we just trust in Jesus and let Jesus do what Jesus is going to do. The progress of the kingdom of God that will inevitably result, everyone will believe in him, will spell disaster for our political fortunes. We will lose our place and our nation. Oh no, they may have said, what are we going to do? the implications of the kingdom of God arising in our hearts are incompatible with our physical, circumstantial, political goals in this life. It may be that the problem that some of these religious leaders faced is a problem of the contradiction between our hope in the gospel and our hope in easy circumstances. Our hope in the gospel on the one hand, and our hope in smooth sailing in a, this world of flesh on the other. Jeremiah 20, 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give you hope and a future. Plans to bring you back from that place that you are in exile. 
plans to make you call on my name and to hear you and to provide for you. Have you ever read that passage in Jeremiah 29 as if it was speaking directly to you personally? God is speaking to the whole people of God, his whole nation in Jeremiah 29, to the nation that's in exile in Babylon. And he's saying, I will not fail to work my work in all my nation and bring them back as a people before me. And in, in every individual case, I will be true to my promise of love and attention and provision. Anybody feel the contradiction that I'm suggesting these Pharisees feel when they see, hear that promise from Jeremiah 29 on the one hand and then they look around at their most intimate relationships and they see trouble, at their most intimate circumstances and they see trouble, at the mistakes of decisions in their past and the consequences that are bearing down upon them now and they see trouble, at an uncertain murky future that fills them with anxiety and they see trouble. And issues, acts of God beyond their control that come in and impinge upon them and threaten their very life, and they see trouble. How do we reconcile the promise of God from Jeremiah? And the situation these Pharisees are in, on the one hand, great evidence of the love of God and the mercy of God and the attention of God. Lazarus came back from the dead. That is awesome. Oh, no. If we let him go on like this, Jesus, doing whatever he wants to do, there may be disaster that results. One way to handle that is to do what Caiaphas did. What does Caiaphas do? Caiaphas, the high priest, he says, you idiots, you have not thought this through. The solution, obviously, lies in grasping the handle and turning the ship. The solution lies in solving your problem with direct action. You do not, you know nothing at all, you, fear, you fearful Pharisees, he says. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Caiaphas is saying, we need to kill Jesus. That's what Caiaphas says. We need to kill Jesus. It's better that we get rid of him and save the nation's political fortunes. Right? Because, and by the way, Caiaphas says this with great conviction because he has been led to prophesy this very thing earlier in the year in his role as high priest. He has been led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the people. And not just for the nation of Israel there in Jerusalem, but for the people of God all over the world. Do you see what's going on here? I love this. Caiaphas is saying, I don't know how to solve this. Get rid of the problem. Look into an anxious future. See what can be done to smooth it out and do that thing with conviction. And we know from the perspective that we take on this story what happened next, don't we? I got a couple questions for you. Were Caiaphas's plans carried out in every detail? It's a rhetorical question. You know the answer, right? Yes, they were. They absolutely were. Did one man die for the people? In the sense that Caiaphas meant? Absolutely yes. Why did Pontius Pilate have Jesus executed? To calm things down so we wouldn't have to come in and pave this place with Roman military might. Right? And Caiaphas' plans were executed to a T. But I, I want to I think, think for just a minute about the Pharisees' fears that they're looking to Caiaphas to solve. What did the Pharisees say? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the worst will happen. The Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Our place, our status in the Roman Empire as a people that get privileges, and our nation, our political system. Another rhetorical question for you. Did that in fact happen? Did everyone believe in him and eventually the Romans come in and take away their place and their nation? Yes. 
40 years, within 40 years of that, of uttering that word, the Romans came in and did exactly those two things permanently. Destroyed the temple, eradicated the political structure of Israel, and it didn't raise its head again until 1948. That is a long, that's pretty permanent, is it not? The Pharisees are afraid that if we let Jesus go on like this, the Romans will come and wipe us out. And Caiaphas says, don't worry, I got a way to prevent the Romans from coming and wiping us out. We'll have him killed. And so Caiaphas has him killed and the Romans come in and wipe him out. Whose plan worked? Well, you could say that neither one of their plans worked. Both of them, the Pharisees that came, that were believers, came and asked Caiaphas what to do. Their plan was a complete failure. And Caiaphas in response said, I got, an, I got an idea, we'll do this instead. And his plan was a complete failure. Or, or you could see that both of their dearest hopes and dreams were completely and entirely fulfilled and met. The Pharisees who came in and said, if we let him go on like this, it would be wonderful. I'm just afraid of the political consequences. To which the, God, the progress of the gospel responds, it is wonderful. Don't worry about the political consequences. Caiaphas, on the other hand, says, oh my goodness, we have got to solve this. It is necessary that one man die for the people, and not just for the people here, but for God's people all over the world. To which God says in Jesus, you are exactly right. We should do your plan. Your plan, Caiaphas, is the plan of plans. One man should die for the people, and not just the people here, but the people all over the world. Because I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give you a future and a hope. And you would be rejoicing with me if you could only see beyond the veil of your political circumstances. You would be rejoicing with me if you could only see with the eyes I could give you that the destruction of the temple in AD 70 is not the end. That the loss of your political fortunes is not the end. that you are only apparently a prisoner of the difficulties that plague you, that you are only apparently a prisoner of the bad decisions you have made in your past and the disasters that have come upon you because of them, that you are only apparently a victim of uncalled for physical distress, that you are only apparently the victim of relational disaster. And that these things, just as certainly and surely as the peace and prosperity that come from my hand, have come from my hand to work in your life mercy. Jesus loves Caiaphas the high priest. This is a theologically large claim that I'm making today. Jesus loves Caiaphas the high priest. And you know what Jesus says to Caiaphas the high priest through the prophet Jeremiah? I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. To prosper you, not to harm you. To return you from the land wherein you are exiled. Can Jesus be saying that to Caiaphas? Who says, I gotta put my hands on the levers of the future and make this thing turn out the way I need it to turn out for my own peace of mind, for my political fortunes, for the goodness and the prosperity of my future. I've got to handle it. And to raise his hand to kill the Lord of glory and to plan the crucifixion. Can the sovereign God work in that abominable, sinful plan? This is the whole point of the Gospel of John. He did. He did. 
That was the plan. He didn't mention Caiaphas by name up until now, but he could have. He started telling his disciples months ago that Caiaphas, the high priest, will spearhead a plan to have me killed. And three days I will, later, I will rise from the dead and inaugurate the kingdom of God. Caiaphas's sin, his rebellion, it's not only that it wasn't strong enough to overdo, overcome God's power, it's that it was the thing, one of the things that God used to bring about his kingdom. It's one of the, the ways that God said, I have plans for you, Caiaphas, people of God, Jews in Jerusalem in AD 30. I have plans for you, my people. Plans to give you future and a hope, not to harm you, but to save you. And I'm going to work in your rebellion. I'm going to work in your sin. I'm going to work in disaster. You look back in your past, I know you do, because I do, and you say, that was a disaster. And I'm working out the consequences of it even now. And if God could look on me with kindness, that would be big of him. But what I really deserve is some sort of judgment. And last week we talked at length about how the, the world of sin that's been touched by original sin is a complete disaster. But I want to say something else about it today. That it is God's first plan for the universe. This is plan A that we're living in. And I have something to say about plan A. Plan A is described in detail in Jeremiah 29. I know the plan. This is the plan, that your plot to have me crucified will result in your salvation. That your plot to have me crucified is a gift of my mercy. I have a plan, and that is that the disaster that has befallen you is part of my merciful schedule of salvation and deliverance. One of our people is on record as saying this week, the Lord is going to use this. Amen and amen. The Lord is going to use this. Here's the perfect example. Here's the, the turned up to 11 example of the Lord is going to use this. Caiaphas, we got to have him killed. There's no other way around this. We got to kill that guy. And don't you see that, the, that God is saying more than, I'm going to use that. Caiaphas, you're a bad dude, but I'm smarter. I'm going to figure it out so this works towards my purposes. It's more than that. It's more than that. Caiaphas, you have been appointed to come up with a plan to crucify my son. This is what I ordained for you from the foundation of the world. Your sickness and your suffering, your disaster, your brokenness, your loneliness, your lostness. It's not just that those things will be healed in the resurrection, although they will be. It's that the Lord has mercy for you in and through them, in the here and now. And as I've said many times before, if, if the Christianity you hear is a Christianity that says none of that stuff exists, and that if it does exist, you're not doing it right, that is not the gospel. Because the gospel includes the pain and suffering of the crucifixion, the pain and suffering of betrayal and brokenness and sin. But the gospel says those are part of his plan. I know the plans I have for you, and the Babylonian exile is part of it. The prophecy of Jeremiah in chapter 29 comes to the, the Jews living in Babylon. And the only reason he has to write that letter is because they're looking around saying, this is a complete disaster. Do you know what happened to Zedekiah, the last king of, of Judah, before they went into Babylon? He tried to lead a rebellion against the occupying Babylonians. Do you know what they did? They lined up all his sons in front of his eyes and slaughtered them, and he watched them all die, and then they gouged his eyes out. And then they hauled him off to Babylon in chains where he lived like a slave. And all of his people, too. Disaster. Plan A in the redemption of the world. He 
includes disaster. And I wish I could say to you that disaster is not part of the Christian life. You're not going to make any mistakes. You're not going to have to bear the consequences of bad decisions. There's not going to be any loneliness or brokenness or trouble or anxiety. But of course it isn't true. I'd be lying and you'd all know it. That's not what the Bible says anyway. What it says is this. I love you. And my sovereignty and my mercy are equally powerful in this world I have made. And my every sovereign act which includes everything that has come down your pike, is also merciful. And I will not leave your body in the grave. Right? I will not leave your body in the grave. I will not let the disaster of your sin be the last word. I will not let the disaster of your loneliness, of your brokenness, of your sickness, your suffering be the last word. I will redeem it. And my glory will be magnified in the resurrection. And our hope, friends, is ultimately in the resurrection. It's because that resurrection is coming that we can look at sickness and we can look at suffering and we can look at sorrow and we can look at, yes, even sin and its consequences and say, this will not be the last word. The Lord is working in it. The Lord has given it to me as a gift of mercy so that I can participate with him in his death and resurrection. I wish I had better news in the short term, but I struggle with all those things myself. And here we sit. And the fact that I believe in Jesus, the fact that I saw Lazarus, as it were, raised from the dead and went screaming into the Sanhedrin, as it were, saying, it's come, the Messiah has come, it's great, doesn't mean I don't also go, oh, but wait a minute, hang on just a second. There's this grand contradiction in my experience between this hope of resurrection that I just got evidence for and the disaster of my life. I'm there too, we're all there. And I just want to encourage you today with the reminder that Caiaphas never stepped one inch out of the Lord's plan for his life. And that that plan is mercy. Not just for Caiaphas, but for all of us. Good thing he came up with that plan, don't you think? Are we not blessed? Because Caiaphas said, we have to kill that guy. We are indeed. Does the kingdom of God go forward? When you screw up so bad that consequences last for generations, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because the sovereign God of all history said this about you, because you belong to the people of God. I know what I'm doing. And what I'm doing is giving you a future and a hope. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.